Hello, I'm Ed Needham, editor of the fabulous literary magazine Strong Words, and this is my podcast, The Five Rules of Writing. In each episode, I speak to a most excellent writer in a particular genre about how they do it. And if you'd like to know more about Strong Words, and specifically how to subscribe, go to www.strong-words.co.uk and you'll be whisked straight to the website. Hello and welcome to The Five Rules of Writing, brought to you by Strong Words magazine. If you'd like to know more about the magazine and how to subscribe to it, take a look at the website, strong-words.co.uk. Don't forget the hyphen. Now, this is a podcast where I talk to writers about the five things they know to be true in writing whatever it is that they write for a living. So whether they spend their days writing the definitive history of snooker or the great Balkan novel, there are some aspects of their work that are absolutely non-negotiable. Today's guest is a man who's made a career out of the pursuit of idleness, not so much running hard to stand still as running hard to lie down with a cocktail within easy reach. Since 1993, he has published and edited The Idler magazine, a publication devoted to the art of idling. And for the last 10 years, he has operated something called The Idler Academy, offering leisurely courses in subjects ranging from philosophy to playing the ukulele. And he has recently published a guide called An Idler's Manual, which promises 24 easy ways to do nothing, from keeping a diary to sitting on a bench. So I'd like to welcome to talk about his five rules of writing with particular reference to the pursuit of indolence, Tom Hodgkinson. Tom, hi. Ed, hello. How are you? I'm good. Now, thank you for interrupting what is presumably several months of hibernation. Um, Tell me a bit about your overriding goal, you know, to rebrand idleness from something disdainful to something to aspire to. Well, that's right. And the whole point of the Idler magazine was to present idling as something good, not something bad. So, you know, more or less, we've all been brought up with the idea that hard work is good. We live by the Protestant work ethic. But I wondered whether that was true. And I questioned that. And I questioned that because I was stuck in a job at the time that I found really boring. Um, And I was uh, I thought, was this a sort of a waste of my time? I'm not being creative. I'm not enjoying myself. Is this the point of life? You know, is this the point of my education that I end up in just working for money? I mean, it seems like a pretty sort of arid, uh, empty life that, you know, they got planned out for us as Jarvis Cocker said. Um, nothing much to shout about. So I wanted to look at uh, idling as a positive. The, the, the name of the magazine came directly from a series of essays written by Dr. Johnson. And as you know, Dr. Johnson, you know, he, he, uh, apparently very productive. Um, uh, he wrote a dictionary. He pumped out the, the the plays and the verse and the essays in the 18th century. He was uh, extremely well known. He's partly well known to us because Boswell wrote such a lovely biography of him. Um, and he was, you know, he's a wonderful guy. And he he, he actually wasn't didn't come from a sort of particularly privileged background or anything. But he wrote this series of essays called The Idler, and they were it was more like a column in a magazine, like you might you might write a column for, you know, um GQ or something. There was a magazine called The Gentleman's Magazine, and uh Johnson for two years wrote a column in this called The Idler. Um and in these columns, you know, he talked about what being an idler meant. He was kind of talking about himself because he was so lazy, he was so constitutionally indolent. Um that, you know, he would lie in bed all morning. He just couldn't get out of bed. Uh, he was constantly resolving to get up earlier next year. You know, in his 20s, he's resolving to get up. He said, next year, I resolved to get up earlier. Um, what what in his, sort of time would he get, would he crawl out of bed? Well, What's he said, you know, his idea, his, he, he said, I, I resolve uh, henceforward to get up at eight. Okay. Um, and even though I might only actually get up at 10, having resolved to get up at eight, that is still two hours earlier than I commonly do live, or I commonly do lie bed until twelve. All oh, right. So he was uh, he was hardcore then. He was pretty hardcore, like late sleeper. And um, but he was also, you know, he was he was ambivalent about his idleness. He knew that on the one hand that his idleness was part of the creative process. So this is what I aspired to as a freelance journalist. You know, two or three hours work a day, um, and the idling that you're doing the rest of the time, which looks to everyone else like you're not working, you are actually thinking about your work on some level. Right. So tell me how your new book, An Idler's Manual, fits into this, Tom. 
Well, this is, you know, I've written, I've done various, <laughs> you know, people can get the theme here. I wrote a book about 15 years ago called How to Be Idle. That was my first book. And, uh, you know, times have moved on a little bit. And we thought it would be nice to um, do a sort of updated version in a sense. And this book was originally designed as a sort of gift for new subscribers to the magazine because people were saying, OK, I get it. I want to be an idler. What do I do about it? Um so I taught the idea of a manual, uh, and I think manual is a really nice word. It comes from the confessor's manuals in the Middle Ages and earlier. There are little handbooks given to monks and priests, which you know help help them to help their um, constituents, if you like, the lay people, to sort of live well. They were like advisors, you know. And a manual was a small book that you could hold in the hand. Obviously, it comes from the Latin for hand. Mm-hmm. A handbook, a guidebook, you know. I also loved the Care Left book. The Care Left did a book called The Manual, which um, some of us might remember in the 90s. And it was about, the subtitle was something along the lines of, you know, how to go from being on the dole to having a number one in the English hit parade, um, if you follow our advice. But, and they did do that, but really it was a manual of creativity. It was, you know, how to, how to live a creative life, um, how to sort of make money out of the things that you enjoy, to, that you enjoy doing, which is one, one way of, you know, living an idler life is, you know, you turn the, the stuff that you like doing, that you enjoy doing, that you would do whether you were paid or not um, into your job, so to speak. Uh, and so I was partly inspired by that. You know, it, it, was, it was a very good practical manual, the Careless Manual, for anyone who wants to have, lead a creative life. Um so what would I find in in the idler's man in the uh, an idler's manual? Then? Okay, well, so I banged this out over the summer. Um, I had to write it really quickly. We we published it ourselves, which is actually quite a stimulating process. Uh, and it's you know it's quite a slim volume. It's about um, 120 pages. There are 24 short chapters, and each chapter suggests a different activity, if you like. That's probably the wrong word, but, you know, an idling activity. You know, one very simple one, for, for example, and this was inspired by Arthur Smith, the comedian, is um, sit on a bench. And I think bench is a, a sort of undersung uh, gift and contribution to society. They're put there by local councils. I don't know when the first bench existed, but they're lovely free loafing spots, loafing zones. And... Benches were a real saviour to a lot of people in, uh, under lockdowns, you know. Um, well, they always come a, with a view, don't they? They're always they're always very artfully placed. No one ever puts a bench uh, staring directly at a brick wall, unless the brick wall came after, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> Yes, although yeah. I don't mind staring at brick walls, actually, because that, that was another of the... Funny you should mention staring at a brick wall, because that was another one of the idler activities. Um, because I, I, I would do that... Uh, I still do that if the weather's OK, but I do that when I get home... In the evening, there's a back. We have a backyard, and there's a brick wall, uh, and I sit on a bench and just stare at the bricks, usually with a beer, um, and that's kind of like an idling activity, and it's like a meditation for me. So I sort of said I called it wall yoga, um, and anyone can find a, a bit of wall to stare at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, if you want to do, to be more idle in your life, then find a, a bit of a wall and stare at it. Or when you see a bench, sit on it. Right. Uh, it's well, this free. Is a, this is a very different uh, interpretation of idleness from, say, the Sky Sports version, you know, where um, you just gaze at their uh, innumerable sports channels. And yeah, I mean, off. yeah, there's I, I, right from the beginning, I, I wanted to distinguish my idea of idling a little bit from the couch potato. Um, so, uh, I mean, absolutely, I'm, I'm the last person to morally judge someone for sitting on on. Um, a sofa with a beer watching watching um, televised sport. I mean, I really enjoy doing that too, particularly if it's snooker. Uh, so, that, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, it's, yeah, you're, what you're, you know, my idea of I think is a little bit more sort of dynamic and active. It's, it's, it's really about sort of, you know, yeah, I can take control of my own life and I can become an autonomous human being. I think right. people, um, you know, if you're in the wrong job or, uh, you have that you have you're badly managed in your job um then work can become really quite stressful uh mm. and your job can become very difficult and you can feel very powerless uh you, you you don't feel that you're listened to you feel disrespected you feel humiliated that you're not paid enough um you know and there, there are a lot of problems with a lot of jobs you know i'm not saying all jobs some people enjoy their jobs but a lot of people feel quite stuck 
uh, doing something that they don't really enjoy. And I think that's kind of a waste of a life. So the magazine um, and the books and things, the Idler's Manual, an Idler's Manual, we're trying to show people, yeah, well, uh, you know, that there, there are other ways of organising your life than around a job. And if you are stuck in a boring job, um, there are ways of injecting some, you know, call it me time into your life. Uh, right. Take a proper also, lunch break. Sorry, you also mentioned, Tom, that you in your in the introduction, you've got this drink with the idler events where you, you say you've introduced people to subversive thinkers, merry souls, brilliant artists and free spirits. Who among these people best embodies the essence of idleness? Do you think? Well, they, they all do in a way because we, we try and find people who are, um, you know, they've really carved out their own niche. Uh, and I find them very inspiring. And that could be, you know, we had Elif Shafak, the Turkish novelist. I mean, she's an absolutely amazing person, um, a brilliant writer. And, uh, you know, she was taken to court for anti-Turkish activities by the Turkish government. Um, she's a massive heavy metal fan. You know, I mean, she was absolutely fascinating. Uh, she's, she does what she wants. But then we had a farmer yesterday, Guy, Guy Singh Watson. He runs Riverford Organic Farmers. He's been farming for 30 years. You know, he works pretty hard. He certainly worked very hard at the beginning and they get up that's at like not, three in the morning, you know. And it's not one of the idler professions, is it? Farming? It's not. I did, farming isn't really an idler profession. I, I did try it myself in a very, very small way. Um, I lived on a small holding and I thought it'd be fun to, you know, grow vegetables, keep chickens, keep bees, keep pigs and all the rest of it. Um, it is quite fun, but it's, oh God, it's hard work. And things go wrong all the time. I mean, I think that's the most difficult thing about farming. You're you know, you have to let go because you just can't control the weather. Um, and that makes life really, difficult. but, you know, but he's a very inspiring, it's a brilliant business. Um, it's, it's almost run on sort of socialist lines that, you know, uh, the, the people who work for it have a share and this sort of thing. And, and he does brilliant work on food. He does, uh, you know, produces fantastic organic vegetables and, and proper meat that comes from, uh, you know, happy animals, all this sort of thing. So he he's very inspiring. But again, you know, we got Michael Palin, who probably wouldn't consider himself to be an idler, but um, he certainly has a. Well, he's never had a proper job, put it that way. And that's when I first met him. He did a, a show called, you know, thirty years, um, forty years without a proper job, uh, and, and you know, that's that's a real achievement. <laughs> um, it's not well, that you don't work at all. You know, I mean, obviously, I, I think about the Beatles. But I'd love to be a Beatle. Um, they they worked pretty hard, but you know uh, they were doing what, what they liked. Um, they had autonomy. They were creative. Obviously, there were only four of them, and we can't be a beetle, but we can try and be a, be a, a little bit of a beetle. From Strong Words magazine, these are the five rules of writing. Okay, so let's get on to your five rules then, Tom. These uh, this is let's going to narrow things down into uh, the. Uh, tricky business of writing two or three hours a day. Yeah. So you said your first rule is schedule. And you say, when writing, I tend to do, you say what you say, I tend to do three or four hours a day. So not two or three, perhaps I undersold you a little bit there, but two, three or four hours a day in the morning. That's how most writers work. Being lazy, I have to be quite strict with myself. So what sort of time does writing get underway for you? Well, when I was full-time writing, which was, uh, I was living in a farmhouse in Devon. I had small children. That was about... Um, 10 or 15 years ago I did that for a few years which was great um, I was getting up anyway because we had small children so I would sit down at nine um, nine on the dot uh, and I would sit there more or less till one and at one o'clock on the dot I would close the computer and um, more recently I, I wrote a book called Business for Bohemians and I wrote that in a library uh, in Shepherd's Bush and I would get to the library at nine or five to nine um, get a coffee, sit there, open my laptop, you know, um, and work till one with a break, you know, uh, and, and and not allow myself to leave until one o'clock. All right. Um, so and that, that, yeah, that, that, that's the only way I could really do it. And then but actually Idler's Manual was not quite as disciplined, but I probably did three hours a day um, each morning. And, you know, I'm quite a fast writer, so I can bang out a thousand or two thousand words um, in three or four hours. Right. So by doing that, by by sitting down every day um, for three or four hours, you are you know it took me six months to write my first book, seven months maybe. Um, you can actually get quite a lot of work done, and that is the only way to write. I find. I mean, I know some people work at night, and I, I could never do that. But three or four hours a day, but every day and timed um, is the only way. It's the only way to do it. I think. There's this brilliant. Uh 
comment by Richard E. Grant that he made once where he was asked if he was a morning or an evening person. And he said something like, well, I'm both. It's the bloody afternoon I can't stand. I totally agree. Well, that's, that's um, <laughs> you know, it's the, I, I, get, I find it often it's really depressing, actually. And I fall asleep and I can't work. I can't think. Um, and then I said, wake up again at about four o'clock. Again, that's another thing about being a freelancer or, you know, having your own business or something, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of allowed to have a nap after lunch, which um, uh, is important, I think. Well, I'm a, an enormous evangelist for the mini nap, you know, even if it's just five minutes or seven yeah. minutes, something like that. But you're not allowed to do that in an office, are you? That's uh, that that would get, uh, you know, you'd be... That get you they, sacked, they yeah. They start assuming there's something really quite seriously wrong with you. Well, it's I used to like manage stealing, to... isn't it? Well, it is like stealing your time back, isn't it? Um, and uh, I, I did used to manage to fall asleep at in an office with my hat, with my chin sort of cradled um, in my hands for a, a mm. few seconds because I, I, I just get, I just couldn't stay awake. I get so tired after lunch. I used to do it at school as well. Yeah, I did um, it at school. It's, yeah, I managed it at work. We should have nap. You know, I mean, offices should have nap rooms, and um, most people feel sleepy after lunch. I think. But you say being lazy, you have to be quite strict with yourself. What masochistic techniques do you apply to bring trouser to chair and hand to keyboard? It is very difficult. My mum is a journalist and she talks about bum on a spring. You know, you'd rather do anything else than sit down and write. And I find it really, really hard to get going. And in fact, the first 20 to 30 minutes um, of writing uh, is always agony, even though I've been doing it for 30 years. You know, and if it's a freelance commission for example that's the moment when i'm i'm like oh, i'm going to email them and say i can't do it i just can't and then then it's not you know then you get into it and it starts flowing but the techniques i would use are <sighs> go to bed early you know i mean if, if i go to bed at sort of half past 10 then i'm okay um i don't really like alarms and the other problem is that i you know i really love sitting in bed in in the morning with a cup of tea for about 90 minutes just sort of staring at the wall um when when is i was that, writing is that time, time well spent do you think those 90 minutes no that is time well spent because i have great thoughts there that's part of the process actually right. uh, but as i said when it was it was a bit easier in a way when we had small children because they just got you up at seven so they were all got out of the house going to school or whatever you know um and so i was up and it was nine so fine um otherwise the technique would be just uh you know get up at eight um shower a cup of coffee a poached egg on toast um and then off i go right so you haven't experienced this thing that uh, many parents say is that even when, when their children grow up they still find themselves getting up at the same time as their children used to no i've never had that problem <laughs> okay second rule then you say aim for a certain word count each day I'm very happy if I get 2,000 words done and would always do at least 1,000. Now, having spoken to quite a few people, quite a few authors on this podcast, that's actually a significant number of words compared to most. How, how did you arrive at this number? Because I'm basically a hack and a journalist and um, my, my parents are Fleet Street hack, were Fleet Street hacks. So I grew up with, um, you know, I guess banging it out basically. And... Um, I think anything less than a thousand words a day, you're not really sort of getting anywhere. Um, I don't really know what people are doing when they, apparently Flaubert was an incredibly slow writer. And then, you know, some people at Balzac, obviously, and Dickens are very quick. Um, and then other people spend hours and hours on one line, you know. Um, yes. I'm just not that kind of writer. I just sort of bang it out. I don't think I'm, I'm not really a sort of particularly sort of literary. I mean, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a sort of particularly good writer or anything. I just sort of just want to get these, uh, um, you know, get a few ideas across, really. So I'm not sort of trying to be a sort of great stylist or anything like that. You're just try, trying to get to the end as quickly as possible. I'm trying to just bash out the words. And so, you know, the only way, uh, all the books I've done, I've I planned out the chapters in advance. Um, so it's chapter one, you know, like in this book, it was chapter one, read ancient philosophy, chapter two, whatever, sit on the bench. So I have all those planned out. Um, okay, I'm going to sit down and write this one. Uh I think people spend a lot of time, we might come on to this in a minute, but they spend too much time, well, the internet's obviously a distraction. Uh, but 1,000, 2,000 words. Anthony Burgess used to do 2,000 words in a day quite easily. You know, I think it's, it's, it is possible. Um, and also, they don't have to be great words. I think that's the other thing. 
Uh, you can go back and edit later. Yes. So the guy, one of the main Simpsons script writers, I forget his name. I mean, he's absolutely brilliant. And he wrote, you know, tons of the absolute classic Simpsons episodes. He says that. He says, you know, advice to writers, just bash out any old stuff. It doesn't have to be good. That's the hard bit, just getting the words down on the page. Um, you can go back later and edit. Yeah. You can't edit an empty page. Yes, yeah, Exactly. Uh, Yes, and what, and what happens to you if you if you don't make your word count? Well, I mean, if you know, I'm not always writing because I'm spending time editing the magazine and running the idle business. So, um, but when I'm writing, uh, I guess you know, if I, if, I if I haven't done something like a thousand words, I sort of feel a bit bit depressed actually because um, I haven't sort of <laughs> created anything. Um, well, I probably wouldn't beat myself up too badly. Uh, I mean, actually, when I was writing my first book, the, the word I was aiming for a chapter a week um, and each chapter was 3000 words and there were 24 chapters. So that's 24 weeks. Um, so actually that's slightly less than a thousand words a day. Um, and a lot of that time was, you know, I was researching, so I suppose it was a bit slower. So I, sp- right. I suppose actually thinking about it, um, obviously I was aiming for like seven or 800 words a day or 3,000 words a week. So but uh, you know, 3,000 words a week means that you can have a bad day when nothing really happens, um, and then you can catch up the next day. So maybe I should alter that advice and, you know, uh, and say instead, you know, not, not necessarily a number of words per day, but a number of words per week. Okay. I mean, one, one approach to making time for yourself is to get all the work out of the way in one big lump, right? So the Irish columnist, uh, Miles Nogopolin, who wrote, books as Flan O'Brien he used to write a week's worth of columns so that's six columns all on a Sunday afternoon it was as it was the only time when he was sober enough so he would uh, he would do do his entire week's work between Sunday lunchtime and Sunday evening and that left the week free for sort of fraternizing in the bars and pubs of Dublin that's fantastic that's that's what you call efficiency you see so um people say oh it's, it's laziness idleness it, it, it's it's another word for being efficient. You know, going back to Dr. Johnson, he wrote he worked really really quickly, and I, I, I'm for some reason I can do that as well. I mean, if I've got a journalistic deadline for an 800 word column, it takes me an hour, maybe two hours, um, and then oof, then it's done. I'm exhausted, and you know, there's this massive build up beforehand. It's hanging over you. Uh, I wish I hadn't said yes to you know, um, and and um, it's late, and I finally sit down to it, and then there's pain, and then it's done. It's like wonderful feeling. Um, but getting it down in that way to one day's work a week uh, is a, a true idling achievement. Yes, quite. Now, your third rule, you say, is uh, turn off email. Distractions are the enemy. Is this the biggest distraction for you, the email? It is, because I, the emails are sort of popping in all the time. Also, housework and the, the, the various things you have to do. In the old days, people like Jerome K. Jerome Dickens, they had servants you know it's so easy and also they didn't have the internet they opened the post in the morning and that was it there's no more post until 24 hours later we have our post in the electronic form popping in like every hour um beeping in and you know because probably like most writers i'm looking for any distraction at all mm-hmm. anything um will take what can take me away from it um and uh and so you know, one friend of mine says you know when you you're, you know, you're often surprised to get such a speedy response when you email a journalist or a writer. That's because they're looking for distractions. And so, you know, <laughs> I, I, if I get an email, I'm like, well, okay, I'll deal with the email now. And people get a really quick reply. Wow, that was quick. Yeah, that's because I'm trying to distract myself. So, so I have to quit the email program. Um, I would like to quit the web browser. Um, and I used to. The, the problem is, I'm, you know, I'm looking up quotes and stuff. Uh, when I was researching Ida's manual I was looking up quotes from Montaigne or whoever it was you know checking quotes checking dates on Wikipedia checking people's you know when people were, were actually writing um checking their bibliographies and obviously you know all, all the stuff's all there on Wikipedia so it's um uh it's great to have that open I would really like to you know shut that down completely one book I wrote completely by hand actually uh which was lovely Deliberately to uh to keep you away from electronic uh um distractions was that exactly and i wanted to kind of it was called brave old world and i wanted to um you know live in the old world so i i shut the computer i wrote it by hand with an ink pen um and if i wanted to look something up i had to get off my chair and walk <laughs> over to my bookshelves and uh pull down the the relevant book and that's actually nice because 
you know, on the internet, you, you, you just get the one fact that you're looking for. Um, if you, if you have to get up out of your chair or go to a library or just go to your own shelves, pull down a book, you glance upon something else, you get smells, um, you find an old postcard that you stuffed in there and it's a much kind of richer experience. So I would like really ideally to quit the web browser, but I know that for a lot of people's work, that's impractical. Mm, quite. Now, you mentioned afternoons earlier and the, uh, the nightmare that is the afternoon. Um, so your fourth rule of writing uh, deals with this. You say sleep after lunch or go for a walk. Plenty of idling time is required for a writer. Um, it, how do you sort of ex, uh, extract maximum value from your idling? Having carved out these extra hours in the day, how do yeah. you um, make sure you're getting you're getting your, your your money's worth from them? Well, I think because you think that well, you know, sleep and uh, dreaming and resting, um, you know, pottering around. Doing nothing, doing nothing in particular, uh, or going for a walk. These are these are really important activities because uh, they're you know they 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 allow your brain to sort of recalibrate and your brain goes into a sort of different sort of a space. The neuroscientists call it the um, uh, the default mode network. So you, you sort of part of the brain shuts down, but another when you're idling, but another part of it is actually becomes more active. And that's the creative part. I think I've got this right. Um, so, you know, it's really valuable, uh, you know, going on a walk and probably like most writers, I, I have like phrases going around in my head all the time um, and uh, little bits of not exactly dialogue, but, you know, think about how I would put things and imagining things. And uh, I had this sort of thing where I imagine what my dog is thinking Um and I've, I've never written that down, but I've, I've, that sort of pops into my head, like little phrases that the dog might be thinking. Right. Well, um, well, if well, was... Hillary, Hillary Mantel used to have this fantastic technique, didn't she? When she was at school, she would walk to school every day and she would. Um, so every single day of her school life, she would think of the perfect sentence to describe the weather. So for how many years she went to school, same as everybody else, I guess, she, uh, that was how she always began the day, like working on the perfect sentence to describe the weather, which really? I thought was just brilliant. You know, yeah. there's, there's nothing but special it, it, about the weather, you know, no, but you, it, it, you, it, it shows you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but it shows you what a real writer she is. And I think George Orwell said that too. He just like, you're, 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 you're sort of writing in your head all the time. It's almost involuntary. Um, so the idling time is important because the idling time might be actually when you're working the hardest on your work and, um, the the writing when you're sitting down and writing is the formal bit at the end of the process when you actually put it down on paper mm. quite quite a difficult process but so so it's you know it's all sort of mixed in together and um uh and, and writers need to sort of live and throw themselves into life and really sort of participate in life quite i mean one of the things that seems to, to un, unite all writers certainly to talk to them on this podcast is that no writers actually enjoy writing no, I think that's very true. I mean, everyone finds it incredibly difficult. It's the hardest thing you can really do. Um, and people who don't write don't get that. <laughs> they think it's easy, um, but they've never tried. It's like Dr. Johnson says something like this, you know, um, these people who've never tried anything think that everything is easy. Well, they, yeah, <laughs> they've never really tried it. They've never actually tried to write a book. I mean, how difficult is it to actually finish a book? I mean, it's almost impossible, mm. you know. Um, and it's a thankless task as well because... You know, <laughs> you write the book, um, then you've got to publish it, and then hopefully someone's going to buy the book and someone's going to review it, you know, and it's just, it's full of disappointments at every stage, you know. Um, and you never have it back from anybody at the end of it, do you? This, this thing, it could have the a life-changing impact on somebody and gets in their hands, but you never get to hear about it. Well, we, that's a good thing about actually keeping the magazine going, the idea, because we do get readers' letters um, and... Actually, we do get letters saying thank you very much, you know, um, and that has kept me going uh, in the past, you know, um, knowing that uh, I had a phase where I was getting quite a few each week um, from people saying, well, thanks, this this book has actually helped me to, um, you know, to, to quit the life I didn't want to leave, lead and to start leading the life that I do want to leave. So I think they're, they're, they're all little things that can sort of can keep you going. But largely it's very thankless. It's full of disappointments. Um uh, you know, Dr. Johnson said, toil, envy, want, the patron and the jail. These are the ills that the scholar's life assail. It was the other way around. But, you know, he said, toil, envy, want, 
the patron in the jail. Okay, we don't have patrons, but you know, Toil Envy want the publisher. Um, publishers dump you. One book successful, the next not successful. You have got absolutely no idea how much you're going to earn. You're earning less than a student nurse, uh, even though you look successful. Um, and you know, it's it's really sort of tough. But uh, the upside is that you have these quite short working days, um, and you have autonomy. And um, also, I think you know, I remember when I published when my first book came out. Um, the sense of creative satisfaction was really amazing. Was 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 wonderful, uh, and it's a very very satisfying thing creatively to do um, if you can sort of pull it off. And having brought your working day to an end by uh, one o'clock, uh, how long should lunch be before you can truly call yourself a writer? Do you think how how, how long should a writer's lunch be? Well, I mean, actually. Uh, when I was really full-time writing or and, and when I've done it in phases, I'd, lunch isn't such a big deal. I mean, um, there's that lovely Keith Waterhouse book about lunch and there's this old, you know, 70s, 80s Fleet Street type literary lunch, you know, where you would sort of actually go out for lunch um, and drink two bottles of wine and sort of, you know, uh, go home at nine, you know. Um, I occasionally had those. I used to have those in the 90s actually when, when I was working on the, mag- on the Id- when we started The Idler. Um, but I'm afraid to admit that um, my, my lunch is generally, if I'm writing a sort of just a, a bowl of soup and a, uh, a piece of bread and a, a, a bit of cheese and not even a glass of wine, which is really uncivilised. Although when I was uh, part the Idler's Manual and Idler's Manual, I should say, uh, for two, I spent two or three weeks in Italy writing it. Um, and I did, that was, <laughs> I thought, well, I'm sort of half on a holiday um, I've done three or four hours this morning. I deserve a drink. So I would have a beer or a glass of wine at lunchtime every day and then have quite a leisurely lunch and then a nice sleep. Now, Craig Brown, who's one of my all-time hero writers, uh, he works from about 8 till 12 um, or 12.30 and then has a, a, a large glass of wine and that's it. And then he has lunch and plays croquet and tennis after lunch. I think he's got that's a really, really. He's oh, I much prefer drinking at lunchtime to the in, uh, to drinking in the evening. He doesn't actually drink that much in the evening. He, he starts drinking at lunchtime, and that's well, it. And you know, I went to interview him, and you know it was like twelve thirty, and he said, "Okay, that's it." He shut his laptop, um, and there was, there's all these like over, there was overflowing ashtray on his kitchen table. There was empty bottles of wine. There was a half empty bottle of champagne. And he just poured out two big glasses of champagne, and I was like. Wow, this is a bit decadent. He said, "Ridiculous! I do this every day." <laughs> Very civilized. I mean, there's certainly a lot less uh, port and sherry in the writer's life these days. So I'm, I'm delighted to hear that uh, champagne is still flowing at twelve thirty in someone's life. Oh, I know so, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and and your fifth rule, Tom, you say work in a room of your own, i.e., shed or study or in the library. I've done both. You say the important thing is to not be disturbed for your three or four hours a day of writing. Lock doors, escape family. Public libraries are great because there is nothing else to do and the studious atmosphere helps you concentrate. So my first sort of response to that was that, you know, have you been in a public library recently where <laughs> you know, children are singing, um, you know, tramps are wandering around? It's, yeah. uh, it's like uh, the market uh, square these days. The yeah, they, they've become sort of community centres. I mean, I was actually thinking about the British Library when I wrote that because um, I had a phase of, well, there, there, were, there were two libraries that were quite good for me in London. Um, the British Library, which you can join... And then you go to one of the reading rooms and that reminded me of being at university, a vast reading room. Um, and you get a massive desk with one of those sort of green lights on it and a, a couple of plugs and a slit. I mean, it is an amazing resource, you know, I mean, it's free. I guess the, this is absolute luxury and everyone's working. You have to work and you can call up books. You know, I called up some really obscure books um, from the library and you, they, you know, they're announced you go and collect it. Uh, so that was wonderful. And then, the other library that I worked in, well, it wasn't really a library, it was a cafe. Um, it, it was an ex-library in Shepherd's Bush. It's now the theatre, uh, the uh, Bush Theatre. Um, and they had this sort of cafe next to it, which is kind of library-like. Um, so I sat there and I know people can work very well in cafes. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, but I've got lots of, I, I don't generally, although I did that time, but I've got lots of friends who are, you know, they can sit down in the Starbucks or the, or the local cafe and really work quite well. And they like the buzz of the, the noise in the background, actually. That's weird. It was quite weird that that helps you to work. 
Um, and then other times I've, uh, when I was writing the first set of books, I, I had a study in our house, which was, you know, absolutely amazing. Um, and I don't have a, we're well, in a smaller house now. We don't, I don't have my own workroom at home. Um, there is an area, but it's quite hard because there's like dogs and, you know, children and deliveries and I just can't concentrate. So, but we do have an idle office. So that's in a way like a kind of a shed. Right. It's a small, it's a small office. I'm in it now. And, you know, we, we, we can fit two, three, four people. Um, so, and I really, I really enjoy that. And that, that's a cycle ride from my house, like a 20 minute bike ride. So I think it, it's it, a shed, you know, it's obviously the ideal I've never had a working shed. Bernard Shaw had a shed, you know, famously Roald Dahl had a shed. And, um, and, and then of course, you know, Virginia Woolf wanted a room of her own to write in. Um, but, in, you know, interestingly, Jessie Cave, who's a young writer and comedian, she was in, she's an actress. Um, she wrote a book, her first book came out this year. She d- d- doesn't have a room of her own. She has three small children. Um, she wrote while that, while she was pregnant, you know, um, she goes to cafes and, and works in a cafe and writes there. So, you know, I think that Virginia will room of your own thing. It's a bit sort of, it's, she also said you need a private income. I mean, it's, you know, okay, but for it's such a tiny number of people, Virginia, who are going to have a room of their own and who are going to have a private income. It's not really very good advice for most people, is it? Have a private income and have a room of your own. Well, how do you do that? Um right. So I'm just saying that you know you, you don't have to uh, you don't have to have this room of your own and and be free of all distractions. So you know it certainly helps. And I've often coveted the shed. I think a shed sheds are great, and sheds you know can be made pretty cheaply. Yes, um, indeed. So very you, good. Now, yeah. just, sorry, just to just to just to wind up a little bit, Tom. So I just wanted to say in your Idler's Guide, you know, which very amusingly contains a number of inaction points. Which of your recommendations do you turn to most frequently? Well, I'm not sure if I actually put it in. Um, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I was on the point of writing a chapter that just, said, just called Drink Beer. Um, <laughs> because I do find boozing a really good way of idling and, and stopping and calming down and putting a sort of stop at the end of the day. Um, you just have to sort of, uh, you know, not do too much of it. But um, I'm just having a quick flick through them. Um, I mean, stare at a wall is very easy to do, isn't it? Uh, there are walls all over the place, and you can always stare at a wall. I think one of the you, you probably need to combine that with one of the other ones, which is a little bit more radical and difficult, which is don't don't have a phone, um, or at least don't have a smartphone, or turn the smartphone off because you know they really invade your idling time. I think um, smartphones and. Without a smartphone, these little moments of idling open up, like sitting on the underground waiting for a train. You know, everyone, everyone gets out their smartphones and checks Twitter or something, i.e. gets advertising thrown in their faces, or their Facebook, i.e. gets advertising thrown in their faces. Google something, i.e. gets more advertising thrown in their faces, because all these businesses are advertising sales businesses. Um, I get out my dumb phone, look at the time, and then put it away again. <laughs> and then you right. say, what am I going to do now? It's like, oh, I'm scared. I've got, you know, I've got to sort of... And then you do, you can do a bit of daydreaming. Well, that's so brilliant. I think, I think a combination of those two things, like turn the phone off and um, just stare at a wall, take those, take those moments, uh, and anyone can be a little bit more idle. Fantastic. So people can buy this book from uh, the Idler website, which is idler.co.uk. It costs £8.95, and it's called An Idler's Manual. And, uh, Tom, thank you so much for talking, for talking us through the complexities of professional idling. Thank you, Ed. From Strong Words magazine, these are the five rules of writing. 